physics factor. Go ahead. Right. Thank you very much. Does it work? Yes, I think. Right, I would like first to thank the organizer for inviting me here. It was a long trip, but coming back to Trieste is always a pressure for me. I want to start this talk thanking my collaborators, Eric Aurel, that also invited me here. Junior Ferrado was his student at the time when we started in Stockholm. And David Machado, which is now my, I mean, a John PG student, he was part of his thesis. Uh, Laura thesis and Eduardo Dominguez at that, at that time he was my PhD student and is now in me major in, in the Netherlands now. All right, so this is more or less the outline of the talk. I will make an introduction about the general problem we want to address here. Then we are going to introduce to get a, give a sketch of the derivation of what we like to call the cavity master equation just because it's a fancy name. You can choose another one and then we want to, I want to present three different applications of this cavity master equation for model with two spin interaction. It's physical model, the dynamics of these simple physical models. That was just to show that the equation worked. Then we are going to look to more interesting problems like system with multi spring interactions and then to uh, this, this old discussion about focus, metropolis focus search apply to the three SAT problems, and then we are going to present very, very general conclusions about the kind of result we obtain here, all right? So this is the kind of problem we want to solve. As you can imagine, this is one of the most famous equations in physics. It's the, known as a master equation. And what you, sorry, and what you want to get is a fast and, inter fast and interpretable way to solve this kind of problem in which you have the probability of a, of a vector of variables that evolve in time following this kind of rule. R here is the transition rate and P is the probability. And what is inter interesting here is that the, all the information about the dynamics is introduced in this R in principle, right? That's the kind of problem you want to solve. And to be more concrete, our, our point is, all right, these sigmas in this case will be discrete variables. Since we are physicists, we want sigma equal one or minus one. And this is kind of inversion operator. And this is very important because it means that you just, at every moment, you just flip one spin locally. And we are going to treat this problem essentially in random graphs, so in very diluted graph. That's more or less the idea because why diluted graph? Because essentially it's where you, we don't have yet very good approximation for this kind of continuous dynamics for discrete spins, right? That's what we want to do. And now we will sketch essentially the derivation of this cavity master equation that starts very easily first writing down what is known as the local master equation. That's something that you get simple, very simply, it's in the textbook uh, exercise in which you trace over n minus one variables. And instead of having this huge and beautiful equation for all the dynamics of the whole, the whole set of variables, you have the dynamics of just one variable, sigma i. And the point here is that now you have many equations, which is not a big deal because you have an equation for each variable. But the big problem is here is that it is not a closed equation because you have this P, this joint probability distribution of sigma i and its neighbors. And then the whole problem is how you treat this uh, joint probability distribution to find out a way to solve the equation or to propose a closure that is meaningful and interpretable and give you reasonable results. That's essentially the big problem in the field, right? So this is our approximation. That's the way in which we are going to work. So we take this joint probability distribution and write it as a conditional probability distribution multiplied by one point probability function. And up to there, you can say that you are quite fair. And then we make this approximation. We say that this conditional probability can be factorized. And the intuition at this point, more or less, is the following. So if you have spin i here, and you have all your neighbor here, what you say is the conditional probability on this spin, given that this is fixed, is independent of what is happening here. 
right? Or the conditional probability be become independent when this is fixed. This is, of course, not necessarily true in the dynamics, but let's say it's an approximation up to now. If you do this, it's very easy to get this equation here. You just plug in this here. And still, you haven't solved anything, because still you have ha a problem of how to estimate this conditional probability distribution, right? That, and that's what we are going to do right now, right? So on the top of that, we have all results, I mean, all now at 2014, I think, that uh, try to study similar problems, the dynamics of similar problems using a kind of generalization of the belief propagation equation. And the idea is that if instead of taking the value of the spin at a given time, you imagine the whole trajectory of the system. So imagine you have a graph and you have the whole trajectory of the dynamics for each spin in the system. So this x1 is spin up and then down, x2 is spin 2 that is down and then goes up and then up for time and then goes down, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What you get essentially is that you can more or less demonstrate strongly that you find sort of belief propagation equation for these trajectories. And this is more or less established science. And these are belief. The point is that this belief connects the history of spin j here with the fact that it's conditional on the history of spin i. This is more or less well known. And inspired by that, what you can do, and you can prove, I would say, rigorously for physics standards, is that this equation implies this equation for a dynamical problem in continuous time. Right? So from here, on the very general assumption that you would say that are rigorous, you can derive this equation here in which you have a sort of cavity probability for spin sim i given the whole history of the variable j, right? And still, we haven't solved the problem because we wanted something with sim i is connected with sim j, not with the whole history of sim j up to a given instant of time. On the other hand, you have this probability here that, again, you have the joint probability of sim i and its neighbors given the history of xj, right? If you accept this, then you make another approximation. And this is the stronger one where we can improve in the future, not in this work, in which you say, all right, similar to this kind of intuition there, you can say, I will have p You have this expression here. This can be written I not J. And this is fair. And then what you say is, all right, now I can Now, what did I do? All right, this is OK. And now I factorize over this. Uh, I'm sorry. This, you can take it like this. And this is what is correct. And then what you say is this piece here, this piece here can be factorized. This is what you get. And then what you say is, all right, this shouldn't depend of xj, because if you go to the or plot, this is i, this is j, and this is k. So what's happening k, if this is fixed, shouldn't depend on j, on this history. And this goes away. And then the only, and the next, and this is not an approximation once you accept that you can factorize this. And then the last point is to say, all right, instead of taking the trajectories, I will make an approximation with only the last point, the last state of the variables is relevant. And you get this equation that I am showing you here, all right? Which is very nice because, again, now you can close the set of equation because you have only conditional probabilities. And this is just something that you can, in principle, numerically solve. Right? 
So let me summarize. You have this equation that we call the cavity master equation that we can derive up to certain point from rigorous observation. And to continue, you have to make some kind of uh, approximation that you more or less know how to improve in the future. And once you have solved this, the only thing you need to do to, to calculate the actual probability you are usually interested in is to set this solution into this equation, which is the local master equation, if you want, under this approximation, and then to solve it, right? And all right, now we have this kind of closure. We want to see how it works. And the intuition was, all right, let's try to see how it works in the simplest possible model. The simple possible model comes from two-spin interaction. It's a physical model in which you want to understand the kinetic Monte Carlo dynamics for the, this kind of Hamiltonian here. Right? So what we're going to make is we are going to run a simulation, a Monte Carlo simulation, the dynamics, and we want to compare how our equation describes these dynamics. Right? We first try with a Monte Carlo, with a ferromagnet model, and then we went back to a Vienna Brain model, which is, of course, more complex, as we will immediately see. And all right, this is the kind of experiments I will, like, I will show you a couple of times, so let's take some seconds. This is essentially, we start with the sample, I mean, the, in very magnetized states, then we make a quench at a given temperature, and then we see how it relaxes, right? And of course, if the temperature is very low and you make this quench at a very low temperature, so the system makes this kind of curve here, you, get, you stay at a given magnetization, the one that, is, that corresponds with the temperature you are going to work. If you instead make a quench at a very high temperature, what you expect is that the system will go to zero magnetization, and indeed this is what happened. And of course, near the critical temperature, so the system more or less gets crazy. And you, we have here three colors, each color is one temperature, and points come from Monte Carlo simulation, after many realization, and the line is the uh, cavity master equation. As you see, the picture is quite reasonable, I would say, if you look to the error, the local magnetization error, so the average over the error at each spin, this is the kind of plot you get. And right at very high temperature, the error is very small, the maximum is very small times. At very high temperature, again, you have this curve. And of course, near the critical temperature, the error is bigger. And then it relaxes at large time, right? So if you now take these peaks here for different temperature, this is the kind of picture you get. So forget now about the green curve. But the red curve is the important one. is the error, the, this, the, this maximum error at a given time and the magnetization. And what you get is that, all right, at high temperature, the error is small. At low temperature, the error is small. At, in, in, at intermediate temperature, the error is large. And what, that's what you expect for a system that has a second order phase transition. All the dynamics here is more complex. And of course, we cannot describe it very well, all right? This is more or less the kind of picture you get. And then we repeat the same experiment, but instead of using the ferromagnetism model, we use a Vienna brain model, which is essentially the same network, but in the link, instead of having ferromagnet interaction, you have plus or minus one interaction. The model is much more complex. And this is the kind of picture you get. Again, this is the same dynamics. You have a high temperature, you find very pretty result for the error. And of course, as soon as you enter into the glassy phase, everything is a mess. So it doesn't work anymore. But nothing works in the glassy phase if we want to study the dynamics. Of almost nothing works, all right? And we say, all right, that's the kind of problem we have. Glassy phase is hard. Let's try to move to a new model that we know that is for magnets, but still has a glassy phase and is interesting by itself. And this is the multiple spin interaction model. It's the P spin model. Here in particular, we are going to use P equals three. I think Lenka more or less talk about the model. I will first, for those that are not physicists, remind you what's the picture of the model. This is kind of general picture of a model of, from a paper from Federico like 20 years ago. We're getting old. And the picture more or less is the following. So forget now about the whole diagram, we are going to talk about essentially four temperature. This is a spinodal temperature. You have a first order phase transition there in which appears, I mean, if you come from a very high temperature in which you have a paramagnet system 
at some point it appears the ferromagnet uh, solution, it becomes stable at this second temperature, then there is a kind of dynamical temperature in which metastable state dominates the dynamic of the system, and then you have a third, a fourth temperature that is called the Kaufman temperature that we expect is the moment in which this glassy phase dominates also the thermodynamics of the system. And now let's try to describe what is in the uh, plot there, right? So this lower branch of the curve is done increasing temperature. So you start from the ferromagnetic, solu ferromagnetic solution and you start to increase slowly the temperature. And what you see is that, all right, you are in the ferromagnetic state. So you are in the ferromagnetic state all the time. So here, this is the ferromagnetic state is stable. In this zone here, it's still not stable, but you're going so slowly that still keeps in the minimum. And then at some point, which is this is spinodal transition, you have this transition toward the paramagnetic state. And now you start to decrease. This is simulation using, if you want, Monte Carlo, and that's the picture you imagine. You start to decrease the temperature. You start from the paramagnetic state. You keep moving through the paramagnetic state because although the ferromagnetic state is already there, it is not stable. And what you expect is that here you will get a transition, and you don't find that. So you find that you've, uh, uh, metastable states start to dominate the dynamics. And at some point, the system, you, you find that it doesn't matter how slow you cool the system, it will never reach the ferromagnetic state. So the system gets trapped in this glassy state. And from this point of view, although the system has a ferromagnetic state that is very nice and very simple to prove, it, the dynamics get, this, get trapped in the uh, glassy state. And for many years, it was considered as a, I mean, still now, it's considered as a kind of paradigm of a system with a very nice ground state that you cannot reach using local uh, stochastic algorithms, right? So let's try to see what's happened if we apply our dynamics, so let's say our set of equation to dynamics and compare them to dynamical equation, so let's say to stochastic equation for this kind of uh, model here, all right? So, of course, now the, mo the model is a bit more complex because instead of having two pair interaction, we have a kind of factor graph interaction and we need to re rederive our set of equations. But that's if you want a, a mathematical analysis exercise once you can do it uh, properly. So, this is essentially the, set, the, 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 the equivalent set of cavity master equation for a system in which the interaction is more general than just by pair. Right? It's a mess, don't worry about it. So the dynamics is defined by this transition rate. So you have Glauber dynamics, here you put tan hyperbolic tangent, if you have metropolis, then you put minimum of between one and exponential. So the dynamics is just defined here. All right? And this is the plot. All right? Again, points describe Monte Carlo simulation, and lines describe the dynamics of the uh, cavity master equation. More or less the same, we make the same kind of approach at this point. We start from a system in the ferromagnetic state, and then we make different quench, right? So if you quench to a very low temperature, so you still are in the ferromagnetic state, you find that this purple line is essentially the same. You, you, you may not distinguish between the, uh, the cavity master equation and the Monte Carlo simulation. And in fact, if you look to the error, you don't even see it's something purple here that I, don't even, I didn't even remember when I was preparing the talk. The, they are the error. And then, of course, you go to a, a big higher temperature. You start to find the difference. It's here. Bigger temperature, you find the difference. And then again, it goes down uh, the difference. And what is interesting here is that this difference here defines, essentially, the uh, spinodal transition temperature. Of course, the error may be big. So our dynamics, as I said, the cavity master equation is faster, it goes faster than the actual dynamics of the model above this uh, spinodal transition. But still, what is more interesting here, what was surprising us, is that independent of that, the algorithms reach the same equilibrium solution. So the dynamics may be a bit different, the, but on the long term, it gets the same equilibrium solution. Okay, all right, let's try to see if we can describe the equilibrium phase diagram we saw before with this kind of dynamics, right? And these are the solutions. So again, points are simulations, Monte Carlo simulation. 
the lines are the uh, solution of the cavity master equation. And this is more or less intuition. Again, you start from a ferromagnet solution and you start to slowly increase the temperature, very slowly, for their cavity master equation. Right? It means that you run the dynamics slower. And the curve is this one. As you see, it really match essentially perfectly the dynamics of the Monte Carlo simulation. And then you do another thing. And now you go to the paramagnetic solution and you start to cool down the system very slowly. Right? Remember that when we started, we thought that we would like to find a dynamical description of this kind of stochastic solution. And when you start to move down, what you find is all right, you get perfectly, you find all these solutions up to here. And at some point, it doesn't get stuck anymore in the glassy solution. So it goes down. And the slower you go, the slower it goes down. So what in principle you find is that, all right, this is a dynamics that is wrong. It does not describe what is expected to describe, but it's wrong in the right way, in the sense that now you have a dynamics that allows you to, to go deep into the glassy phase. And that was surprising, again, in the good way for us, because, all right, now we can sell a new product to the community. We have something that go in the right direction. And all right, it's a bit more tricky than that, because actually what he's doing here is not that he's finding actually the ferromagnetic state. And this is a non-trivial point, because for the PSP model, why you have this glassy state? The idea of the, you have this glassy state is that essentially for the system it's the same to have a plaquette with three spin down, I'm sorry, three spin up, or having a plaquette with two spin down and one spin up. When you see the, 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 the energy of, the, of this configuration, it's essentially the same because it's the product of the three spin. Right? For, for them, it's the same. And what's happening when you run, that, that, at least that's the intuition, that when you are running in the local Monte Carlo the dynamics, is that all these configurations, that are low energy local configuration, get essentially blocked one to each other. So the, the, the system doesn't know which configuration to choose. What we're doing here is we're doing a dynamics in which you get, in principle, macroscopically, macroscopically the same energy, but you are averaging over all these solutions. So in principle, if you want to, if you look to the probability of the system, it has the same probability of being three spin up or having two spin down and one spin up. So this is not actually the ground state of the system. It's not that you find this ferromagnetic state, but it's the, the, the idea what he's doing is just to averaging over all the possible solutions on the ground state of the system. And that's something we are going to see later that is, again, an advantage of our algorithms. And at this point, we say, all right, that's very nice. We understand what is happening. Let's try to exploit this anyway. And now we are going to make the following experiment. We are going to sit down at very low temperature and start to fix a fraction of the spin in the ferromagnetic direction. And the question you want to ask is whether our algorithm is better to find the ground state than the usual Monte Carlo. This is the kind of question you want to answer now. Right? And these are the results. So now, on the right side, you have Monte Carlo for different size, and here you have kinetic Monte Carlo. The idea, again, is the following. You are at very low temperature, so in principle you should be in the ferromagnetic state. If you leave the dynamics going out without fixing anything, it goes away from the ferromagnetic state. That's something that uh, we know. No, I'm sorry. You are not in the ferromagnetic state. You are in a disordered state in a, in, in a, at a temperature in which the ground state is, a, is the ferromagnetic state. So what is happening is if everything is free, it will never get the ferromagnetic state. That's something we already know. And now we say, all right, I will fix one spin. Let's try to see what happened. One spin is like here. Nothing happens, so the system is still in the paramagnetic state. And then you start to fix more and more spin, and really they get fixed. And this is the kind of curve you get from Monte Carlo. So essentially, when you fix like 30% of the spin, then the system is able to get the ferromagnetic state. And on the contrary, if you use our dynamics, what you get is that essentially with 15, half of the result of Monte Carlo, you get the right ground state of the system. So again, it is a wrong dynamics in the glassy phase, but it's the, uh, wrong in the right way if you want to study the, what's happening in the glassy phase, all right? And with this result in mind, we say, all right, now that we have something that works 
this kind of way for the glassy phase, let's try to look to a more complex problem. And then we move to the dynamics, to algorithms that were used in the past to study the NP combinatorial optimization problem, particularly three SATs, right? Let me remember, this is the problem, this is SAT, three SAT problem. In principle, you have N variables. So here, N means five, but in principle, N is as large as your computer can accept or your algorithms can accept and take n. And then you have m clauses. Clauses are this kind of formulas within brackets. And you say that the, this kind of problem can be easily translated to an easy-like problem, making this change of variables. And this, again, translates in a Hamiltonian, which is a pin-spin-like Hamiltonian with disorder, if you want. You have the product, I'm sorry. And all right, I get crazy, all right? The problem, essentially, and then the picture, the, the thermodynamical picture for many years within the community, actually, is more or less the correct picture now, was more or less the following. If you have, if you are in this regime in which you have many variables, a few constraints, so the problem can be easily solved. That's very easy. You have just one pure state in the system. Then if you have many clothes and a few variables, so alpha is very large, then the system is unsatisfiable. So both these states are very simple. And what is interesting that the prediction for many years was that there is this dynamical temperature, the dynamical transition in which you have many states, and there is the place where algorithms get blocked. So after this, the, the work was refined. And there are in between now, I think there are two or three more transitions, Lenka. I don't know, something like that. And, but more or less, the general picture is that in this zone here, or perhaps a bit farther, further here, you have the uh, heart problems, right? That was the uh, intuition. And that was in contradiction with some dynamical results, some algorithms that do not, do not obey detailed balance. And in particular, this is a Metropolis Focus Search, which is essentially a Metropolis algorithm in which you, instead of taking randomly the variables, you choose variables only in those clauses that are unsatisfied. And that's why focus. So instead of making a stupid metropolis in which you just flip a variable with a given rate, if they, I mean, randomly, you just choose randomly the variable, you say, all right, now I will look only to unsatisfied clauses. And in this unsatisfied clauses, I will choose variable and this, the one that I am going to flip. And this is essentially this, all this red stuff here. If you threw down this line, it's essentially a metropolis algorithm, right? And there is a parameter, which is eta. I don't know why the author at the time uh, called it eta, but it's essentially e to the minus beta uh, whatever. It's a kind of measure of the temperature of the system, right? And this is the kind of picture you get when you run FMS for this kind of problem, right? This alpha d and alpha c is where the system, what you in principle, you should find hard instances of the problem. So in principle, no local algorithm that was intuition at the time will work in this way, in this zone. And what happened in particular was that focus metropolis search are, uh, follows more or less the, this pattern here. A high temperature, it works up to here. It works up, up to here. It works up to here. Then it fails. And then a low temperature. It failed here, it failed here, but there is a particularly very well-tuned range of temperature in which it essentially beats the dynamical transition temperature, right? For many years, there was a debate about, I think, perhaps there is yet, a debate about this is, these are finite size effects, or this has, and then the proponents of the idea of Fogg metropolis said, no, the problem is that uh, we are out of equilibrium, we do not obey the day balance, and we do not... Uh, in principle, have to respect the results you get making equilibrium analysis of the problem. And then what is interesting is that now we have a new set of dynamical equations that can describe semi-analytically this kind of uh, algorithm, right? And let's try to see uh, what it gives to us. This is a typical, dynamical, a typical dynamics for the cavity master equation, sorry. And essentially, you have start at very high energy. And, in the, and this is for a particular value of eta. 
you start a very high energy, and what you see is that when alpha is small, it's indeed find the transition, so the energy goes to zero. And for given alpha that is large enough, so the energy doesn't go to zero anymore, right? So in principle, you find that it more or less describes the, uh, the expected behavior of the system. And then you want to compare this with the phase that with right, Monte Carlo simulation, and this is the picture. Lines now are uh, focal metropolis search, uh, uh, I'm sorry, lines represent cavity master equation dynamics, and points represent focus metropolis search uh, results. And all right, you see that for slow alpha, it more or less reflects very well the behavior of the metropolis search. And, and of course, it does not coincide exactly where the transition is, at least for this value of eta. Then you make this same, this same simulation, you do it for different values of eta, different values of alpha, and try to reshape the phase diagram I showed you before to see how, well how well it compares. And these are the results, essentially. So the, the triangles are still results for the focus metropolis search, and the Circles are uh, resolved for the cavity master equation. And what you see is that, all right, we don't get exactly the uh, dynamics of the cavity master equation, of the focus metropolis search. You, we get a phase transition from SAT to SAT problem that is go a bit before, but we follow very well the trend. But what is more interesting is that in this interesting zone, so for low values of eta, we don't we go very well to describe what is the focus metropolis uh, doing, and we really reach with these dynamics very near the Saturn Sat transition. In fact, you find here that you can go even better than the uh, focus metropolis uh, search. So in principle, indeed, what we are trying to say is that effectively this kind of Non-equilibrium algorithms can, instead can really give you some clue about the, uh, can, can give you a, a new opportunity to find solution of to optimize problem that in principle by equilibrium computation shouldn't be uh, tractable. And then I'm going to these general conclusions. I'm going to the first. Cavity master equation, I think, constitute a good proxy to describe the local dynamics uh, of stochastic algorithms with discrete variable. I think it's not the best you can do. Probably in the future we will do better, but at the moment I think it's quite reasonably a good starting point to describe this kind of system, to describe physical system, but also to describe algorithms in particular. So algorithms that you design to solve problem, I hope it will be useful in the future for this machine learning community. And in particular, it's very useful to explore the equilibrium low energy states inside glassy, glassy phases. So although we know that in the glassy phase, it is in principle wrong if you want to describe right the uh, equilibrium configuration or the equilibrium of, or I'm sorry, Although in the glassy phase we know that it is wrong if you want to describe the metropolis dynamics. It is wrong in the right way because it allows you to look deep into these glassy states. And that's the uh, good point on this stuff. And with this I want to thank you everybody. And that's it.